we are going to start talking about how to pick stocks and shares. And as I say, I'm here to learn as well. I've brought in some experts. Um, I have I have my own views. I have some you know some some stock picking tips that I would use. But there are others, definitely these guys who've been doing it for quite some time, who can certainly answer your questions about how to pick really good stocks, stocks that, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of funds, um, particularly index tracking funds, and you can generally do pretty well with those. And that's something that I talk about a lot um, in my, my workshops. However, if you want to make some serious money and potentially lose some serious money, actually. Hello, Paul. Good to see you. Sorry, um, I'm late, Jasmine. <laughs> Good to see you. Technical um, issues. Oh, I understand. Yes. Um, so if you want to make some serious money, it is it is possible with um, investing in individual companies, but it takes a lot of effort. It takes work, it takes thought, it takes knowledge. So you do have to be willing and able to spend extra time um, really studying the market, studying sectors, doing quite a bit of, of extra work. So to help us have a think about this today, I've got three experts. Now I've already introduced two of them. Um, we've got David Henry, who is an investment manager for Silky Chaviot. Give us a, a wait, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, I've got, um, I've got here that um, David makes the day-to-day -day decisions rega regarding client holdings um, at Quilter Cheviot. And uh, Quilter Cheviot itself, if you haven't heard of it, they um, are a wealth management business offering financial advice, investment platforms, which is interesting. We'll talk about that later, David, <laughs> and fund management. Now, Paul Clifford, who's just joined, give us a wave, Paul. That's it, thank you. Um, Paul Clifford is of Sandlam, is a, he's head of the Manchester office. Now, somebody's got something, got, got radio or something talking in the background. Oh, there we go. Um, so, um, Paul Clifford is from Sandlam and he's the head of Sandlam's Man Manchester office. He's got over 18 years of experience working in capital markets, a wealth <laughs> management professional, providing investment advice to private clients and institutions. Um, Sandlam, again, if you haven't heard of it, is a financial <laughs> services company, including financial planning, investments, and wealth management. And finally, my friend Bill Kay. Bill, give us a wave. Um, Bill, and I always get this wrong, but apparently he was a former personal <laughs> finance ed editor of the Sunday Times and former business editor of the Times. And now he's an investing columnist on the Times's Tempest column, which analyzes companies that you might like to invest in. And he very much, I know, because we've talked about this a few times, he very much invests his own money and uh, he's, he's always looking at um, companies to invest in himself. So, this is a free open webinar that you can ask questions at any time. No question too dumb. Just be aware this is this is um, for any level of knowledge of of share picking, or stock stocks and shares investing. So there are no questions that are too silly. It's quite possible that if you've got a silly question, somebody else is wondering about that one too. So feel free to ask. So you can either, as I said just before, you can either just open up your mic, ask a question or put up your hand um, or, or put something in chat. That's all fine at the moment. Um, as I say, I'm uh, recording this at the moment. So what I'll do is I'll edit it. Well, I won't. Somebody else in my team will edit it. Um, and then I'll upload it onto Money Magpie um, and I'll, I'll turn it into an article so that you can read it and also watch it uh, and listen it again. So this is all about how to choose individual companies and individual funds, um, because we, we can talk about, um, you know, funds that are also companies, uh, which can be worth considering as well. Um, and it's, it's something that takes quite a bit of effort um, if you're gonna do it properly. And for a lot of people, it, it's not necessarily worth it, but it can be a, quite a fun way of potentially increasing your income by investing in funds, but also, you know, dipping into it, thinking, oh, go on, I'll have a go at Tesla, I'll have a go at whatever this, you know, Coinbase, this, this new company that's coming out. Um, so, and it's, it is possible to make really good money by doing this. So I'm gonna get the ball rolling by asking my experts first. Um, I, I'm gonna ask, a question that I'm I've been wondering myself what what is the most important thing 
you need to look for in a company that you think you'd like to invest in? What are the, what's the, the, the first, the big thing um, that, that you've always, always got to look at with a company? Bill, let, I'm going to get you to start, start the ball rolling because you're a journalist and you're used to answering questions. Well, this, this may sound a bit mystical and Buddhist, but I think the first thing you have to know about before you invest is yourself. Um, you have to look into really what, what sort of personality you have, what sort of risk you're comfortable with. Whether, as you say, you need to go to the trouble of analysing balance sheets or you're happy to, to buy an investment trust or a mutual fund. You know, all these are outcrops of your own personality. And then the sort of, then the types, the different types of companies, whether they're large and well established, like Marks and Spencer, or whether they're brand new, has just arrived on the market with a, very new and inexperienced management team, but a brilliant idea. You know, so some you'll like, you'll be attracted to, to one sort of company or another. Right. And I think analysis flows from those basic you know, strategic decisions. Okay, so, so you're talking sort of broad brush, really, before you even pick a, a company itself. You've got to do that first. Yeah, you've got to do that first. Really think about the sort of company, whether you're going to go one for one that's um, well established or, or a new one what what kind of person you are what you, what you're what, what you're willing to to risk if you like yeah and what you were saying about you know having some money for fun that's what a lot of people do they have their serious money and then they have their fun money um, maybe 10 percent five or ten percent of their of their savings and put it in there and which might take off or or you, the worst you might lose it now a lot of people are happy doing that not everyone is but so some people, you know, a lot of people like to just have a bit of fun on the side or a flutter with something that's fashionable, you know. Yeah. So, David, in a kind of a way, as we were saying just before, that's sort of what you're doing. I mean, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily fun money that, that you personally invest for yourself. But you were saying that the majority of your, your personal money is being managed by someone in your company. But uh, you do actually invest yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was... Bill put it absolutely perfectly, I think. I mean, one of the things I recognize about myself is that doing this for a day job, there's maybe a propensity for me to overtrade my own money. And we get lots of ideas here within the firm. And the danger is that I go off and I'm a little bit like, you know, a financial magpie, I suppose, is an apt way of putting it on this webinar. You know, you're always attracted to the bright, new, shiny thing. I mean, for me, that you know, that money, individual stock picking money, you know, five to 10% of my overall is kind of a mix of private investments, um, money that's invested in a way that I wouldn't necessarily recommend for clients. But the key, key point of that money is that it helps me to stick with the main bit and to stick with the core. So if you've got a sensible, diversified investment strategy that's fit for your own purposes with 90% of your money, if you want to go and have a swing of the pot, as it were, with that other remainder of the pot, then I think that's something that's really useful to have. And certainly for my clients who are interested, absolutely go and do that because if it helps you stick with the core, then it's fulfilling a job even before you've started to make some money. So when you say your, your core and you're saying sort of a core diversified portfolio, um, what, what would you, I mean, obviously it, it's different for different people at different ages, but um, what would you say the fundamentals of a, of a div diversified portfolio for, for that 90%, where should it be on the whole? Again, you know, it's very much driven by what you want and what your financial objectives are. So for me, for example, I'm 33. I'm going to be doing this job for a couple of decades at least. Um, so I'm 100% in stocks, particularly in things like my pension that I'm not going to be able to touch for well, until 55 for 22 years. So very happy to take a level of risk with that. Um, in terms of diversification, there is there is a point I think to make there if you are managing your own money. You know, Peter Lynch, very famous investor in America, always said, "Invest in what you know." And if you, one of the advantages I think that you can have as a private investor, you know, I'm lucky enough to deal with people who have been very successful in a given field. And if you have a particular expertise of a particular sector, then that is a, an advantage for you. You maybe have a little bit of an informational edge there. The danger though, is that you invest in a ton of different, or sorry, a ton of very, very similar things within the same market. And your portfolio ends up all pointing in the same direction. 
you don't have enough eggs and enough different baskets. And I think that the reason someone comes to see me, certainly the reason that I give most of my money to another team here is that more boring side of it, the risk management, because coming up with ideas is the fun side of it. Sometimes you need someone, a third party to say, well, actually we need to spread things a little bit here. So when I've dealt with private investors who've managed their own money in the past, you do occasionally see that they've gone down that road of investing in a very similar place and not maybe having enough of a spread mm -hmm. geographically across sectors or even by asset classes, so not just in stocks and shares. Yes, yeah, so you, you're you thinking sort of, for, for many people, you'd have a mix of stocks and shares and possibly bonds, although bonds aren't doing terribly well at the moment. And as you say, maybe quite a lot in, in British, in, in your own home country, but then um, it, having having stocks and shares in, in other, or funds in other countries as well, and definitely other sectors. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think the country the country um, point is, is a very salient one, Jasmine. The, we did a study as a business a couple of years ago, looking at the typical makeup of a DIY investor, if you like, port, if you like portfolio, um, and tends to be, we exhibit what's called a home country bias. So we, here in the United Kingdom, we'll invest in United Kingdom businesses rather than investing geographically. I went away and looked at the numbers and actually I was surprised a little bit. That hasn't cost, that hasn't cost you much as an investor if you go back 20, 30 years, but certainly over the last 10 years, it has really cost you if you hadn't invested in America, for example, which has done by far and away the best over the past decade, then you would be really, you know, missing out on some returns. So, yeah, I think you do need, in my view, certainly to be wary of investing you know, too close to home um, and getting a good spread as ever, which, you know, all of the people that do my job say, but there's a reason that we say it because mm -hmm. it is the best way of reducing your risk and getting a better risk adjusted return over time. Yes, exactly. Great. Paul, Paul, coming to you, Paul Clifford. Um, so we, we've sort of talked about, if you like, thinking, thinking about investing. So I don't know, let's go back to my original question. If you're looking at an actual, I mean, maybe let's, let's pick Tesla or Vodafone uh, or, or GlaxoSmithKline or whatever. Um, what, what would you say if you are interested, and a lot of people seem to be interested in investing in Tesla, for example, what are the most important things you need to look, or the most important thing, couple of things that you should look at with hmm. this, this company before you actually decide to put some actual hard cash into it? Okay, so um, Tesla's a, a, good, uh, a good example to, to select, to choose from. Um, I think the thing with Tesla is it's in the news often. Hmm. Uh, it's, a, it's a very high profile, social media high profile stock. And it's easy to be seduced by the, you know, the CEO, Elon Musk, all the way down to what he's doing, uh, what's, what's Tesla about. Uh, the returns last year were, uh, you know, uh, incredible, really. And, um, I, you know, I, I was asked at the end of last year by the Daily Mail, actually, uh, what, would I, what would I invest a thousand pounds on uh, next year? And I suggested that, and you have to maximize your return. So I suggested that I would short Tesla uh, using a, a leveraged investment. It was actually, you know, fallen about 20, well, 18% year to date. Um, and it's, it's, it's all about growth. It's all about future returns for Tesla. So its current returns are, are small relative to um, you know, earnings I'm talking about here. So Tesla's earnings are very small compared to someone like Volkswagen Group. Uh, but it's all about the future with Tesla. So we look at something called the price earnings ratio for stocks to determine whether or not it's over, overpriced, underpriced, or it's about fair value. So Tesla's a bit of a strange one, because as I say, it's all about what's going to happen in the future, and that's priced into the price. Uh, but it's price earnings, um, it did get up to 1,200, which is a ratio. 1,200 on a PE is ridiculous. It's, it's, um, to look at it another way, if you bought a company, it would take a company 1,200 years of earnings to pay you back for what you paid for it. That's one sort of very sort of very simplistic way of looking at it. So Tesla, in my view, at the start of the year, was massively overpriced. So would I have bought it at that position? No, I wouldn't. But then most of last year, Tesla just kept making new highs. And at every new high, I thought, well, this, is, this has got to be the high. And it was just momentum and hype that drove Tesla's share price. And we're seeing something 
a bit more, uh, well, I wouldn't say it's fair value even at today's uh, price. So Tesla's a very interesting one. So could you explain again what you were saying about PE ratios? Because I think th this is something that you see a lot and, and it, it takes a bit to get your head around it. So um, if yeah. you could give us a, a Ladybird book guide to PE ratios, that would be really good. Yeah, so uh, a, a company makes earnings. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't make earnings, sometimes a, you know, a company might not make earnings in a year. It might have a bad year and it's, it's made a loss. We saw that uh, last year. Um, and you really want to try and value the company based on its earnings and future earnings as well. So each share class, each share has an earnings per share. So if you divide the actual share price, say it's a hundred pounds by the earnings per share, say they're 10 pounds per share, then you get a PE of 10. Mm -hmm. So if the earnings falls, say to five uh, pounds per share, and the share price stays where it is, then you've got um, a, a, a PE which falls commensurately as well. So um, this one way of establishing value, whether or not, you know, a company can make uh, good earnings, has good free cash flow, uh, low debt, and the, the share price itself is reflective usually of long term earnings. Great. Well, thank you. That, that is really helpful. I think the, the more that we can get, ex you know, these terms explained, the, the better for us. Now, we've got a couple of questions. Gareth has asked, um, and I'm going to start with you again, Bill, on this one. Um, What's the best place to get to go to to actually buy and sell shares? <clears throat> Which is, it's a, this is, I'm glad you've asked this, Gareth, because I was going to sort of talk about this because it used to be that you would, you would have one of those sort of posh stockbrokers with, you know, panelled walls and everything like that. And you're talking about my broker. Now there's a load of platforms that you can use. Bill, what do you use or, and what do you recommend to other people? For myself, I use an execution only broker. So I'm paying the minimum. Uh, charges to buy and sell, no advice, no frills. I get a, I get a tax statement every year. And that's about it. Um, again, it comes back to the amount of experience and, and the, the temperament of each investor, how much help you want or need or willing to pay for. So you can go to Paul or David for a bit of advice. You go to a wealth manager or you, you go to your bank. Oh, yes. There's of places you can go depending on what you need. So what, which one do you use? Because, um, I mean, there are, and we'll certainly talk to David about this because it looks like Quil Quilter, I didn't know that you did, did a, a platform, uh, David, uh, Quilter, but um, uh, so which one do you use, Bill? XO, X-O, which is owned by Jarvis, I think. But it's just xo.co.uk. And you go on there and you can just, you know, log in and then you, you, you put some, you deposit some money and then you can say, I want to buy so so many shares in so-and-so company and they'll quote you a price and it happens very quickly and you know, very easily. Yeah, because diff they're, they, they seem to have different prices, diff different pricing systems. So, I mean, uh, for example, ones that I'm aware of just off the top of my head, AJ Bell does one. Um, Fidelity has one, um, Charles Stanley has one. They're, they're essentially fund supermarkets. I mean, the, 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 that seems to be that. That's something slightly different, a fund supermarket. True, that's that's true, yes. And so, um, yeah, okay, so you can you can still buy shares through fund supermarkets though. Um, yeah, so, but, but then, but the sort of platform that you use is an actual, if you like, proper stockbroker. It's just an online stockbroker, surely. Yes. That's all it is, with yeah. no advice at all. You're and, on your own. Uh, yes, and how much does, you know, what are the charges that you get? Because again, there seem to be different sets of charges depending on whether you want to do a monthly thing or per share buying or per trade, I mean. Well, basically there's a minimal you know, charge on the actual, uh, each deal. And mm. then they, they charge about an admin cost of about one or one and a half percent a year for you know, ha having the stuff on their books and giving you um, an end of year tax um, you know, analysis. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's minimal, it's a, it's a couple of percent. Right, right. So, so it's, it, it is a really cheap way of doing it, basically. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And well, they, what, what about, uh, how, how do you, how, how does the Quilter uh, platform work and what, what does it do? So, 
yeah, when you asked this question originally, Jasmine, I could feel my marketing department breathing down my neck. <laughs> uh, it's a service that we offer. We offer a bunch of different services, everything from what's referred to, as, as Bill says, their execution only, which is, I won't give you any advice. You've got to make your own decisions on the portfolio all the way through to discretionary portfolio management, which is you and I agree a strategy that's right for your family and then I go away and manage it and make the individual decisions on the portfolio. Mm. Yeah, I think the key thing again is to work out what's, what's going to be right for yourself. Yeah. Uh, a little bit and everyone knows the comparison websites, you know, to go and look at or you can compare those, um, you know, compare the, pr the price on the, the execution only service because ultimately if you are doing, making your own decision making, mm -hmm what you just want is a platform that is reliable and mm. cost effective. It's a very commoditized business. Mm. It's not about value, maybe, you know, depending on how you intuitive the, the user platform is or, you know, customer service, those things come into it as well. But ultimately what you want is something that works. Yeah. <laughs> the more you can contact where it goes wrong and it's not expensive. So, you know, those are, those are the metrics in which I would, you know, look at it, but, Certainly, if you're looking for advice, then you're you're looking at one of the the fund houses. Excuse me, the private client investment management houses, like like I work for. But mm -hmm. again, and I'm afraid it's a very dull answer to your question. But you've got to work out what's right for you and what do you want. With yeah, because it seems to me, for example, you might, as as you've said, you might have the majority of your money, ninety percent of your money maybe being managed or maybe it's it's actually in in pensions and all that kind of stuff already but you want to do some of your own little you know little investing i say little you know with 10 percent at five as you say five ten percent of your money you want to do it yourself um and you want to do your own research so you the, to me the the obvious place to go would be one of these platforms one of these execution only brokers and as you say it's just a question of looking at, at some of the comparisons see which one offers the, the the cheapest and frankly as you say has has the best well it, you know it's going to be solid it, it's not going to just suddenly fall and and take your money with it um i think ones that have a have good good references good reviews that's that's what i would look for i'd look for good reviews and you know cheaper prices um and that's the sort of thing. Um, Paul, do you, do you have any thoughts on this for, for individual <clears throat> investors? What platform they should use? Uh, I personally use Interactive Investor, uh, but the, as, as um, David mm. and Bill have said, there's, there's many, there are many platforms to choose from now. Uh, some of them are free, actually. Mm. Um, and it's free. Uh, yeah. yes, some of them don't charge any commission. Um, they offer, I mean, like they sell your information. Uh, when you sign up, you, you you provide them with plenty of information, and that's that's your pact with them, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, the I'm trying to think of the uh, the platform that uh, saw the GameStop uh, fiasco a few months ago. Right, but, yeah. Um, Robin Hood, um, I think it was called, and that's a free platform. eToro is a free platform. Toro, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, Interactive Investor, it's a great site. I think it's about £10 per trade. Uh, mm -hmm. But you get a lot of information as well uh, available on stocks, which is useful. Yeah. That's so that's neat. the one I use. I should just like to say, actually, Jasmine, something yeah. Bill has said in the comments, and he, quite rightly, when I said, um, when I was asked by the Daily Mail um, to maximise my returns with £1,000 going into the new year, to maximise my returns, but also max risk, would be to short Tesla 10 times. I would never advocate anyone to do that. No. Um, but that was what I was asked and that's what I came back with. Um, and, and it's actually worked out. But within the first week uh, of the new year, my thousand pounds would have been wiped out. Right. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so it's good to good to know. Yeah, I must admit, shorting is something I just go oh, scary. Yeah. scary. It's, it's you know people who know what they're doing, like like you, that could do the shorting side. Yeah. Um, actually, and and do explain again uh, for all of us, Paul, what shorting actually means. So shorting is essentially you borrowing a stock of somebody, mm -hmm. selling it, and then returning it to them at a pre-agreed date. So say you hold a hundred Tesla shares mm -hmm. and you're quite happy holding them. And I said, Jasmine, do you mind if I borrow them off you? I'll give you them back in three months time. And you say, go for it, Paul. And you'll charge me 2% for that. Mm -hmm. So you'll get your Tesla shares back in three months time, in which time I think share price is going to fall. 
So I sell them on day one when I borrow them off you at $1,000 or whatever. I think it went up to $800 or something. Mm. And then in three months' time, when they're at $500, I buy them back for $300, $300 less, mm -hmm. return them to you, and I pocket the, the difference. $300 quid, uh, nice per, one. Per show, yeah. So Absolutely. that's basically how you short the market. You're borrowing stock that's not yours to return it at a future agreed date. You really do have to have balls of steel to do that kind of thing. I think you know to do actual the, the shorting where you've already you borrowed it up, so you've sold it for this amount because yeah, you just it, it is a bet ultimately. You just you're assuming yeah. that it's going to go down. Well, you're assuming that the price is going to fall. You mm -hmm. think you know it's, it's overpriced at the moment. I'll short that. A lot of hedge funds short um, these these shares. And it happened with GameStop as well. That was uh, another one that got shorted heavily. First, it was invested in heavily and then shorted heavily. It creates a lot of volatility in the market. Some people argue that shorting actually creates, creates an equilibrium as well mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and, help, and helps prices discover their fair value. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's a good point. And actually mentioning GameStop, that, that is an interesting one. I'm sure everybody here has heard about the, what happened with, with GameStop. I've never even heard of GameStop. I mean, it's very much an American um, shop, um, chain of shops. Um, but it, it got bigged up big time on on reddit particularly on social media there it, it was almost like I, I mean i don't know what the word is it's not quite activist investors it's not the same thing as an activist but there was basically a group of people who were like yeah we're gonna really pump up um gamestop particularly i think to to have a go at uh, hedge funds i seem to remember yeah. so yeah. yeah what 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 happened there explain that again paul the, the hedge funds had it in for gamestop so they were short in gamestop <laughs> And if it goes, so if you expect the share price to fall, then you might short it. If it doesn't fall and it starts to go up, you have to unwind your position pretty quickly or else you lose your money. Mm -hmm. And one of the hedge funds in particular lost a hell of a lot of money. And I think actually put them out of business. But the, you know, the hedge fund guys and girls, they're, they're intelligent people. And the rest of them soon caught on as to what was happening. Yeah. And they got on board and, you know, they, long, they went long the stock as well. And then when it got to the ridiculous high, they probably shorted it. So yeah. ultimately, it was a very brief win, perhaps a pyrrhic victory for the activists. Yeah, it, it does sound like, as you say, hedge funds, they've got very clever people and, and big pockets, big, deep pockets. So yeah, they're, they're going to work it out. But it does, uh, you know, sort of, again, beg a question. I mean, we talked about Tesla earlier. Um, is, is it honestly, is it worth following what people are saying on social media about shares there's um we've, we've been hearing about all sorts of people on instagram tiktok you know i can't believe this um people sort of giving stock tips and everything on, on that i mean david you've uh, is this a worrying trend or is it actually is are, are there some accounts that you can follow for genuine stock tips um i have a couple of rules of thumb um if if i if someone is proffering an opinion on a company or markets or a stock and they don't manage anyone else's money there's no accountability there and frankly i've got pretty zero interest yeah, yeah. The second thing to say is um i would caution against even listening to star fund managers opinions on the stock market um often what people are saying in public and what the makeup of their portfolio looks like are two very very different things they might be expressing a preview in public but actually the underlying portfolio looks very, very different. I mean, Ray Dalio has been very bearish for a very long period of time, but his flagship funds are, you know, pretty sensibly well-diversified portfolios. You know, there's nothing, you know, he's not 100% cash by any stretch of the imagination. So there's, there's a couple of health warnings there. Um, ultimately, I think what you've got to get right in your own head is what you're trying to achieve because the opinion of a 55, 60-year-old billionaire on how their portfolio looks I dare say, well, it's certainly of very little relevance to me. <laughs> I can do that every day to day. So I think just always you've got to be careful. And like everything, you know, financial media is set up quite a lot of the time to try and goad you into engaging with it and doing something. And quite a lot of the time, the right advice is to do absolutely nothing. <laughs> right. Oh, that, that's that's music to my ears. I like doing nothing. Just put the money in and leave it there. Yes. Um. Anybody else? Um. Bill, do you have any any thoughts on that? Um, it's a very good point about star managers because they're always being quoted, star fund managers and whatever. They've been quoted in the press. Um. But quite a lot of the time, it's it doesn't doesn't come out what they say doesn't work. 
No, well, I mean, I think whoever's giving advice, the first thing you've got to know is where they're coming from. Do they hold the stock? Yeah, what's, what, what's their, why are they telling you? Why are they giving you the advice? Well, quite often it's, it's perfectly obvious, but once you get into social media, which is a complete, you know, wild west jungle, if I can metaphors, yeah, you, you've got to assume the worst. Everyone is, is either they're being mischievous or they're pushing their own, their own stocks. So the old, the old saying was, where there's a tip, there's a tap, which means <laughs> you know, uh, uh, people are, so they're, they're pushing something for a reason. Yeah. Um, which, once you've made that decision, can mean that social media is not really very helpful. Um, but it, you know, at the very least, you've got to know whether they know what they're talking about, um, whether they're talking any sort of sense at all, whether they've analysed the company. Yeah. Who, who are they? Absolutely. Social media, that's very, very difficult to do. I do think that in, in newspapers, whatever, we, we need to see um, what the, the writer is, is invested in. So I know on, for example, The Motley Fool, um, when people write about certain things, at the bottom it says, Milton is, is invested in blah, blah, blah. You know, he has investments in this, this and this. And, and I think, honestly, we ought to have that in newspapers as well. Really. Yeah, there's been a constant debate in newspapers. I mean, all the time I've been in financial journalism, some papers, used to ban uh, investment outright. If you, you, if you want to come and work for us, we, were, we don't want you holding any shares at all. Wow. So completely clean. I, I always thought that was a bit too much because the counter argument was, you know, if you don't buy it and sell shares, you don't know what it feels to make or lose money. So yeah. How can you advise other people? Absolutely. That debate has gone on and on, but you'll find very few newspapers actually say, what, if anything, you know, what, what shares their they, they, journalists hold. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and there was, I do remember some time ago, the Mirror, wasn't there, there was some some dodgy thing about some um, uh, journalists on the Mirror and they, they were bigging up this, I don't, can't even remember what it was, but they, they all had investments in whatever company it was. Yes, I think they said they were. It was a couple of guys, James Hopegood and I forget who, and all forget who the other guy was. But what was going on there was that the then editor of the Mirror, Piers Morgan, started taking an interest. Mm -hmm. and, um, well, the belief is that he he was sort of dabbling in and out of whatever they were tipping. Mm. Uh, that was the yes. Then there was an inquiry which Morgan, I have to say, was found not guilty. Yes. Uh, it, it did get very messy indeed. It, it did, but yes. I, I, rem I remember that time, whenever it was, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, if you're writing a news story or if you're even doing a column where you're discussing a company, you know, like... I don't know, national, you know, national Grid or mm. something like that, then, you know, the argument either stands or falls on its own merits. You're not just saying buy or sell, you're giving some sort of reasons based on the known facts. So it's easier for readers to assess whether you're you know, saying anything valid or not. Mm, quite. Quite. Now, um, who, who would like to ask, ask a question? The, it, I've got lots of questions I can ask. But I, this is open to you guys. Um, this is your chance to ask the experts. If you're wondering about a particular stock or a particular sector, or you've got questions about how to invest and how to think about it, um, open open up your mic. Just um, just tell me. Just come and, and uh, tell me what you think. Or put something uh, like like Gareth did. Put something in chat. Do keep um just just put up your hand or as i say just say oi 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 i've got a question so that's perfectly fine um so while i'm waiting for, for questions from you guys um one thing i would i was actually thinking about today was um buying into unloved stocks so for example you know at the moment esg um environment society governance this that, this is a big thing and everybody's piling in it seems to me into um alternative energy sources all that sort of thing and i thought if i were going to invest in energy at the moment i would be investing in nuclear i think because it does seem to me that long-term nuclear actually is is where the the energy source is going to be and they're much better but that you know is it, to me quite an unloved sector um so Paul, um, I'm going to start with you. What what do you feel about um, unloved um, stocks, unloved companies? Are, are you likely to get a, a good deal with with something that's basically non-fashionable? 
Yeah, absolutely. And it, this goes back to what's fair value. You know, are you paying a good price, a high price or a low price uh, for a stock? And the unloved, you know, the unloved uh, stocks out there. Um, one I in particular like last year was Cineworld. So oh. Cineworld, Cineworld was very much unloved. Uh, nobody was going to the cinema. You know, we we're all in lockdown. And Cineworld managed to secure some, you know, financing, which saw it through the, the, the lockdown. And if you just go and have a look at Cineworld's returns from around uh, the end of the summer to the end of the year, you would have uh, been a happy person if you would invested in it. And um, so too with some of the more what we call cyclical stocks. And these are stocks that do well when economies are doing well. But we had a very strange year last year. It was a very, very strange year. Um, the economy shut. It was a very binary thing. It was either on or off and everything just closed. Typically, when we see recessions, we just see, you know, demand falling and uh, prices falling and, and we go into recession. And these are what we call cyclical moves last five to six years, typically. What we saw last year was just the economies closed. Yeah. And those companies that depended on, you know, people visiting the establishments like Cineworld and retail and things like that, they, they had no earnings. Earnings got turned off. So uh, there was a mass exodus from those companies. But we looked at what we call the survivability factor. You know, can these companies, will they still be here in two years time or three years time? And uh, I thought Cineworld, you know, once it's secured its funding, yeah, it's through, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to see itself through to the other side. Uh, so that was an unloved stock that returned well. Um, some of the more obvious cyclicals are like financials, banks. Banks are very cyclical in nature. Uh, and Barclays and Lloyds and a few of the other UK banks, uh, they've done very well. They were very much unloved. Uh, again, because, you know, the economy just shut. And, yeah. um, and, and interest rates are very low as well. So banks tend to make money from rising interest rates. They borrow short and lend long. So it didn't look good for banks, but uh, since uh, since the end of the summer last year, we've seen interest rates um, start. To, well, future interest rate expectations are, are going up, yeah. and banks banks tend to uh, do well in that scenario. Yeah, oh, interesting. So, um, yeah, there's, there's there was a lot of opportunities last year. Yeah, well, uh, a lot of opportunities. But as you say, you you kind of need to be able to see into the future because uh, yeah, certainly if I'd looked at Cine World, I'd be thinking it could fold. So, so you you had the the knowledge. You actually did the research to find that. I actually uh, Warren Buffett, um, you know, a, a, an investor that many of us know. And if you don't, Warren Buffett is probably the most famous investor of all. Uh, I remember uh, some of the stories that um, he, you know, he's got a lot of anecdotes. And in the seventies, he was in a restaurant, and this is something that we can all observe on the street. We can observe that Cineworld has no customers in it. Yeah. So you probably wouldn't want to invest in Cineworld because there's nobody in it. Uh, Warren Buffett was in a restaurant in the 70s and he, he noticed um, that people were paying with credit cards. And he asked the maitre d', he said, what credit card are most people using? And it was American Express. And the next day he went out and bought a lot of American Express. And that was one of his best investments. So that's something that you can see, you know, on the street, you know, observations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to have, you know, the accounts of the company and, you know, and look at something too technical. If you can see something, that seems to be around. I mean, Domino's Pizza is another good one. Domino's Pizza 15 years ago, it was a small chain. Now it's the dominant pizza chain. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the, share price, the share price has gone up commensurately. I think we've got a, a few more questions, but what you've said, Paul, just reminds me, of, I, I kept seeing adverts. Um, it was eToro, we've mentioned eToro.com. Um, and eToro had all these adverts on buses saying, basically, you know, invest in what you know. Yeah. Um, which is, I can kind of see that. I mean, as you, as you say, if you're, if say you eat in restaurants a lot and you notice, you know, like Warren Buffett did, that people are using this particular credit card, well, that's a good idea. But say, for example, you work in retail, um, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, retail's done pretty badly on, on the whole. Um, but but is, it, is it a good way to, to work, you know, that you invest in what you know and what you personally um, use, perhaps? That's what, that's what David was saying earlier on. It's the Peter Lynch uh, you know, advice to invest in what you know. But going back to what you were saying about the American Express thing, I, I, don't, I doubt if Warren Buffett went straight out and bought American Express just like that. I'd imagine being a good investor, he checked up on the balance sheet and made sure that, that it was properly run and well financed. Properly. It's, it's a nice product. Doesn't mean to say it's a profitable company. 
Good point. Good point. So now, um, Anna, Anna Thackeray has asked, um, invested in Chinese tech, and I don't know how to make my first purchase. So, oh, interested, sorry, not invested. So you're interested in Chinese tech, um, Chinese tech, tech companies, I'm assuming, um, but you're not sure how to make your first purchase. Yeah, good point. Um, I mean, David, you talked about um, buying abroad as well. Um, how how would Anna go um, go about this? How would she she you know research it and then physically buy um, Chinese tech companies? I mean, I guess I think my jumping off point Anna would be if if you don't know how to make your first purchase, maybe stick to a fund route initially and try and find a fund that is invested within this space. So the fund that we like is Veritas Asian, um, which holds a number of different. Uh, Chinese companies as well as others in Asia as well as the name might suggest mm -hmm. you're getting a broad base exposure and you're not having the same level of volatility the share price moving around because you're buying a basket of companies rather than just going to buy well Chinese tech synonymous with Alibaba and Tencent would be the two names that spring immediately to mind I think the other benefit of going down the fund route as a private investor here in the United Kingdom is you know, I know that a lot of these self-investment DIY platforms are often, the charges to buy an individual overseas company are, are often a little bit higher. Oh. So it's maybe a more cost-efficient way of getting broad base exposure to a, a theme and an area that you like. We like it as well for what it's worth in mm -hmm. um, a cost-efficient way in a way that's maybe not going to keep you up awake at night as much as going and buying individual companies. Yeah, so that's a good point. Um, so there's a good start, Anna. Have a think about funds, um, and then maybe later on, um, as you say, have, find a, a, a good platform that doesn't charge too much for investing in individual companies abroad. And speaking of which, um, Eve has asked, uh, what's the best way for beginners to buy stocks? Is it a platform? Is it an app? Uh, what are the fees to look out for? And we, we've mentioned this already, but I think it's worth going, uh, you know, looking at, at again, you know, because the, there are apps again, eToro's got one, there's, there are quite a lot of investing apps that are coming out now. Um, but, I, you know, I wonder with the apps, if you've got enough information there, I mean, it kind, I kind of feel that you, you sort of need a bit of a, certainly execution only, but it's quite helpful to have um, the information that you can get on on a full website. I, what, what do you think, Paul, Paul? What do you think? Or, or no, sorry, Bill. Bill, you were about to speak. Come with advice. I mean, if you go somewhere like Hargreaves Lansdowne or, uh, or I think AJ Bell, one or two of the others, they've got an app. You can deal. But if you want to get advice, they, they can do that as well. You probably pay pay a bit more to get through a firewall, but uh, you can combine the two. You know, of, of doing your own dealing and getting advice. So when you say advice, you, you mean actual advice, not not just those pieces of information? That it they... won't be specific to you, because without a face-to-face -face interview, that would be impossible. But at least, you know, say if you want to buy uh, American Express or Glaxo, then you can you can click on you know, the appropriate page and see what the latest views on those companies are, which oh. is better than just buying them cold. Yeah, that's that's a useful thing. Hargreaves Lansdowne, their 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 fees are quite high. I seem to remember. You come back to the point. They they uh, they do offer a fair bit of advice, and maybe they're just um, high priced. I'm not uh, I'm not sure, but yes, they 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 charge quite a bit. a bit more. Paul, you use Interactive Investor, and I'm guessing that's sort of a similar similar reason. Although you wouldn't need the advice, you you've got your own uh, way of finding the information. I'm guessing. Absolutely, yeah. But even then, I still invest personally in the stocks that, or the sectors that I know well. Mm. Um, so a, a Chinese tech stock, I would completely advocate what David says. That's a very specific, very specialist um, uh, investment. So I would go with a professional and use a fund. One of the funds we like is Polar Cap Tech, Polar Cap Technology Fund. And uh, Scottish Mortgage as well. They're two sort of quasi uh, tech funds that are, are very good to invest in. Uh, I personally, I quite like the house builders, the UK house builders. It's a sector I've followed for many, many years. So mm -hmm. I understand the nuances. And, uh, and to arrive at a decision, whether it's, uh, you know, you should buy it or sell it or hold it, you know, there are many various, there are many fundamental factors. I mean, I mean we've talked about uh, the fundamentals, you know, the accounts, whether there's free cash flow, whether the company has low debts, uh, whether it makes earnings, Some, sometimes companies don't make earnings. Tesla didn't for years and years and years. Um, has it got a defensive moat around it? Has it got a strong market position? 
Then we also look at things like technical analysis. I don't put too much stock in technical analysis because that's really looking at what the share price has done oh, okay. rather, than, rather than what we think it's going to do. That's looking at charts. And that's where people get seduced by the Tesla chart going up. They all oh, buy that. Quite often, that's the wrong time to buy it. When it's gone up, you really want to look at it when it's fallen a lot. And why is it fallen? Uh, and then there's the anecdotal stuff like, you know, um, uh, Warren Buffett walking into a restaurant and seeing everyone using American Express is definitely not the reason, sole reason why he bought American Express the next day. But he just, you know, it's, it's a gauge of many things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, it, and you draw an analysis, a uh, conclusion from the analysis, whether you want to buy it or not. And, uh, and really, you're looking for something that's fair value or even better undervalue in your opinion. Mm -hmm. It's very subjective. Yeah, well, again, you know, the, the unloved stock. So it's, it's a good sector, probably a good company. But for some reason, nobody's interested or it's, it's just it's just not sexy at the moment. So people aren't buying it. Yeah, I mean, this is something that, uh, as we know, you've mentioned Warren Buffett and um, Benjamin Graham, who Warren Buffett followed um he wrote the book the book really the investing book the intelligent investor and that's definitely something that he says a few times um to to find really good companies that are going to last do well for a long time and wait until they're cheap basically um and uh, that's it's it's like anything you know get, getting a good good deal finding something when it's cheap um now cs i don't know who cs is but cs asks what are penny shares and are they worthwhile? David, David Henry, what do you think? What are, what are penny shares and are they worth having? Uh, so penny shares is a, is a phrase that's been used to coin, pardon the absolute horrific pun there, um, coined to use to refer to very, very small companies um, that were typically traded in America a few decades ago. You're, you're looking at incredibly small companies. A lot of these companies, there's significant business risk involved in them. I guess my advice would be if you know if you're asking what they are, I would probably stay away from them. A lot of them are marketed as quite get rich quick schemes. I think again, sounding terribly boring affair, but if you're going down this route of trying to find small companies, I would I would advise going through a fund if um because then you're getting a basket of diversified exposure to that to that asset class. Mm, interesting. Um anybody has any Bill, have you ever bought a penny share or yeah, penny shares are uh... You know, traditionally shares which sell for pennies for you know, less, you know, the share price is, is 10 or 20p or less mm. you know and uh, they're usually companies as David says which are either very small or very risky they may have come down from a great height mm. they may be just starting out so you know they're very high risk but they're the sort of com sort of shares that if you like the company and the sort of business they're in or they may be local to you then you can feel you can you can buy you know, 100 shares for really very little money. So yes, it's so a, a, a low price. But yeah, they're, in, in their nature, they're high risk. Right, so high risk. So it might be worth a punt with a very small uh, amount of your money if, if, you, if you really like them, but yeah, um, otherwise not. Um, now, Annie, you've asked um, an opinion on Hargreaves Lansdowne. Um, I, I, I think Hargreaves, personally, I think Hargreaves Lansdowne are good. I just think they're a bit expensive. As a journalist, they have fabulous press releases. I'm always massively impressed by their press releases. And they are really, really good at media, I have to say. You know, there's always somebody um, who's got a good answer for things. So, um, but, you know, as, as a platform, um, yeah, I think they're, they're fine. Just, just a bit more expensive than the others. So I would... Personally, I would I would be looking at some of the others um, from a price point of view, really. Um, now, Georgiana um, says, I wanted to find out more about investing from 5G. Oh, um, no, into 5G companies. Is this a good idea? Um, what about the chip shortage? Good point, actually, there. Um, so in a way, you know, we're almost talking about, you know, Chinese tech again here, um, 5G companies. Paul, do you have a view on 5G companies, particularly um, when it comes to this chip shortage, which we've been hearing about over the last couple of weeks? Oh, sorry, you're muted, Paul. I was just typing, so I muted myself. Um, yeah, the, um, I mean, the future is 5G, isn't it, in that, in that tech space? Uh, the question is, which, which, which 5G company would you invest in? Um, again, I would advocate using um, a fund for that, for that sort of exposure if you wanted to invest in that uh, sector. Um, and, and, and one of the risks is supply that we've seen recently, you know, semiconductor supply. 
um, has become an issue because a lot of com those nations that make them or certainly dig the commodities out of the, the stuff out of the ground to make them, uh, those economies have closed. So it's uh, we've seen a supply shortage and price increases. Right. But do you think that's a short term thing? Well, yeah, I think it, I think if we can get to grip globally with COVID-19 and we can get the all the economies opened again yeah. and commodity commodity supply will you know resume. And um, it would be, I, I would imagine it's a short-term uh, supply uh, squeeze on, on yeah. inflation in those in the, uh, prices. Seems like it to me. David, have, have you looked at any 5G companies or any that you think are, are worth looking at? So um, I'm going to shamelessly steal the work of our tech analyst, Ben Barringer here. Um, we have done a lot of work around it. We struggle to see the use case for 5G in the same way that we have done for 4G with internet video and 3G before us. Um, I would agree with what Paul says, quite a lot of these themes, you know, think about the gold rush, you wanna be selling the shovels rather than taking the gold out of the ground. So we quite like a business called Sell Next Telecom, which is listed in, on the Madrid Stock Exchange listed in Spain. They own a number of telephone mass towers and a lot of these telecoms companies are selling off their mass towers, often at quite distressed prices because they need to raise funds. The cash flow isn't that great at the moment. Selnex basically comes along, aggregates these towers. If you think about, you know, when it's owned by you know, Vodafone, for example, in a tower, they can only run their own signal through it, whereas tele uh, Selnex can take that tower, have four or five operators running through it. It increases the, uh, the return on that individual asset. It's in some ways a wee bit of a boring business, but that's kind of what we're after. And I think when we look at 5G, that's that's the best way that we see of playing that theme. You want to own the infrastructure rather than you know take exposure to the brands or, or take a risk on the use case, which we don't know what it's going to be yet, frankly. Yeah, I do think that's that's a clever way to think, as, as you say, rather than with a gold rush, you don't don't invest in gold, you invest in the in the shovels. And it's it does seem to me a lot of the time it's you know, we, we talked about unloved shares, but it's the boring ones, you know, boring companies that you've never heard of that, that do something technical or sort of, ish, you know, technical issue. Those, those seem to be companies that are really worth looking at because they're not talked about in social media. They're not hyped up. So they could actually be, you know, decent price. No, it's not the sort of thing that's going to get shouted out on TikTok, I can assure uh, you. <laughs> So you mentioned that it's on the Madrid um, Stock Exchange. What what was the name again? Cellnex Telecom, C E L L N E X. Uh, not an investment recommendation. No, of course, not none of and none of this is invest. I should have said this right at the beginning. None of this is investment recommendations. These are not. This is not advice. This is just a chat. So if if say. Um, um, Anna wanted to in, invest in it, for example, or who, whoever it, um, it was, um, would, would you be able to invest in something that's on the Madrid Stock Exchange through Interactive Investor, through Hargreaves Lansdowne, through AJ Bell, one of those? Yes, that is, that is functionality that those platforms who you mentioned offer, yeah. Yeah, great. Um, sorry, that was um, Georgiana who asked that. So Anna's asked the question now, um, how do you know if you're getting a good price for a stock? Whoa, that is such a good question. Yes, how do you know? Um, you probably don't know until later on. I don't, well, I've got you here, David. What, do you have anything to say on that? How do you know if you're getting a good price on a stock? Yeah, I saw that question come on that made me smile. You've absolutely no idea. <laughs> Absolutely no idea. Uh, that's the nice thing about this game and the market. You know, if you you can't have an ego, and you know, we've mentioned Peter Lynch a couple of times. He said, if you're absolutely brilliant in this business, you'll be right six times out of ten. Mm -hmm. It actually sounds like a very very low number, but the nature of stock markets means that you know tails drive everything. Mm -hmm. the winners provide overall the vast majority of the return of the index. So actually, if you're right six times and one of those two, one or two of those names does really, really well and much defeats the index, then actually that's where your returns are going to come from because the median stock underperforms the index. That's just, you know, that's what history has shown us. So you've got to be comfortable with that. And the returns that we get from stock markets often are from those feelings of discomfort, one of which is you've absolutely no idea whether you've paid mm -hmm. too, too long or, short or lower or higher price for security. But the longer your um the longer your investment horizon, the more chance you have being right.
Hence why I tend to say, just to, just invest in index trackers. Bill, you, you're waving at me, hi. I was gonna make about, uh, whenever someone you know, thinks they're buying at a good price, you can bear in mind, there's someone on the other side who thinks they're selling at a good price. <laughs> Yes, that's a very good point. So whenever you think you're buying it at a fine price, there's someone on the other side who thinks they're selling it at a good price. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would add. I would add. Um, if somebody's getting it wrong seven times out of ten, then give me a call. I'd like to know what they're doing because uh, there'll be a great reverse indicator, just the opposite <laughs> to what they do. <laughs> Excellent. Um, now Liz is saying advice on eco investments, please. And this is what I was saying earlier, ESG, um, e e eco well, green, green investments, eco investments, they're very popular at the moment. So Paul, mm. do you have any advice on investing in eco investments? So one of the other things we look at um, uh, is the environment a stock is in and eco green ESG is very much on vogue at the moment. And um, uh, so Boris Johnson and um, Joe Biden have both signed mandates, you know, and, and, and commitments to a greener environment, a greener society. Uh, and companies that have benefited from that are like the wind farm. So we have Orsted in our uh, portfolios. We quite like Orsted. Um, and, and that's the way the wind's blowing. Um, I think you mentioned nuclear before, Jasmine, which is very interesting. After what happened in Japan with the earthquake at Fukushima, mm. I think Germany that Germany then said straight away, oh, "We're having no more nuclear in Germany." I think that might be something they regret um, in, in time. But uh, yeah. mm -hmm. you have to look at you know some of the governments, some of the administrations. Where are they spending money as well? Uh, because there's a hell of a lot of money being spent just because it's very politically um, it's a vote winner. Mm, uh, it might it might not be the most efficient way of producing energy, but it's a vote winner. And yeah. it's the way we're, it's, it's the way of you know it's where the wind's blowing to use a bad pun. Yes, absolutely, it is literally the way the wind's blowing. Absolutely, I mean my my feeling. I, I th th there are a lot of issues um, around what they call ESG, and in fact, I did a podcast. If you go on on Money Magpie, have a look at our podcast thing. I, I interviewed a few fund managers about ESG investing because. Um, it is, as you say, it is the thing to be doing at the moment. Um, but I find that there are, there's a lot of what they call greenwashing ha happening mm. at the moment. So there are a lot of funds, a lot of funds now calling themselves, oh yes, we're green, we're you know good, good on ESG. And then you, you, you drill down, you find about all sorts of unpleasant stuff in there that I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't describe as, as eco. Um, so I mean, I'm, I'm guessing really, um, uh, David, uh, I don't know if this is your area as well, you know, it's, it really is a question of, of doing your due diligence when it comes to finding if they're, they're genuine green credentials. Yes, I think so. I don't think there's any shortcut around it, to be fair. I mean, one thing the finance industry has been absolutely excellent at over decades now is rebadging something, making it look new and using it to sell products. And mm -hmm. um, I think that the... You know, when I look at ESG, I consider it to be just an integral part of our analysis and understanding of the risk of a business. Because frankly, if you're investing in a business that's a melting ice cube that is not behaving in a sustainable way, showing good governance, that is just you know a factor into normal investment management decision. Mm -hmm. so if you want to avoid certain areas of the market, you know, oil and gas, for example, because you feel uncomfortable in supporting those businesses. And I think it's just really worth having a chat with someone about it because these things are entirely subjective and there is a lot of grey area and that's one area where someone like myself or Paul at their side can help a wee bit. Yeah, uh, Bill, you're, you're uh, waving. Well, I just uh, think you can also come back to the point we were making earlier on about buying the shovel, not the gold mine. There's a lot of money to be made out of the whole, the whole transformation of the economy into, into greener and more sustainable technology, I mean, we understand that we're going to have to replace all our domestic boilers over right. the next 20 years. Well, there'll be someone supplying that, the engineers, um, and the, the other big beneficiaries will be the big uh, supply companies, I mean, like British Gas, who are also in electricity, they are benefiting from more efficient energy. Um, so there's a lot of ways into, into the green story, short of buying, say, a wind farm.
Well, that's a very good point. Now we're we're past the hour, so we, I'll just we've got quite a few other questions. I'm just going to pick one. Um, again, fifty thousand or sixty nine thousand dollar question here um, from <laughs> Anna. How do you know when to sell your stocks? Yeah, how do you? Know, if only <laughs> any any ideas, Paul. Going to start with you, a quick one. I, I think I think that's the most difficult decision to make yeah. uh, in, in in buying, holding, and selling. It's always the selling. People hold on to stocks when they're going up, mm. quite rightly in many cases, although I often sell stocks when they are going up. And one or two of my clients challenge me on why I've done that. Uh, and it's really it's because I don't look at the charts or momentum. I look at the fundamentals and what the stock might do tomorrow or next week or the following week. But um, equally, when stocks start to fall, people think, well, this might be the bottom and it starts to recover again and they hold on to it all the way back down again. And um, I talked about GameStop earlier and the, the losers there would have been, unfortunately, would have been the retail investors, the mums and dads, you know, the, the, the kids have got a bit of money, the students. They would have gone up with the stock and they would have fallen with it a lot. So mm -hmm. it, key is to be disciplined. What do you want to achieve from an investment? That's the first thing I would ask. Um, if you think, 25% return on this and I'm happy. If it, if it grows, if it goes up 25%, sell. Mm -hmm. Stick to your discipline. If it goes up another 25%, ignore it. So what? You've got, your, you've got what you wanted. Yeah. Um, and just, you know, try not to get too emotionally attached to it as well. Stick to what you said before you went in uh, and, and stick to your discipline. Great. Uh, Bill, what do you think? Well, I, mean, I think uh, well, the short answer to Anna's question is you sell when the shares look horribly, horribly expensive. <laughs> That's the time you look for money. But I mean, what you're really, you have to pause by that being objective. You've really got to go in every day or every week whenever you're looking at your shares as if you just bought them and say, would I want to buy at this price? You know, knowing what you know or knowing what's, what's happened in the news or whatever, you've got to go in completely cold as if you didn't own them already and make an objective decision. And that's the hardest thing to do. Yeah. I mean, to decide it's you know, time to get out. Oh, yes, absolutely. And finally, David, what's your what's your view on this? Um, this is the this is the one question I ask every professional fund manager who comes into the business because it's really, really difficult. And I certainly haven't got a silver bullet of an answer. Um, so take that as a caveat before I begin. I think you know, mentally how I think about it is you can't beat yourself too much up about it. I think there's a tendency when you're making an investment decision do want to try and get the optimum outcome and you're just not going to get that. That's just a fact. Yeah. So I think the way I come at it is trying to have an idea of what's going to minimize regret here. Mm -hmm. And we are human beings. We are conditioned to feel the pain of loss more than we do the success of gain. So actually, you know, if you've, if you've bought a share, you feel like it's done well, you know, Paul's saying made a 25% gain, think to yourself, how am I going to feel if this halves from here? because that is a common frequency in stock markets. And if that really worries you, then take some money out of it, trim that position, take your original investment out, whatever it happens to be, but have some mental framework that you can go back to. And once you've sold those shares, if you sell the whole position, try not to look at it too much because you'll only just torture yourself. And as I say, it's so, so, so difficult that um, you know, you're only just gonna, you're never gonna get the optimum outcome. Um, thank you so much. I've just, I've just replied, Anna. I've just replied to your direct message. So you email me about what you you were saying uh, about that app. Um, we we are well um, over the hour. Thank you, thank you so much, um, David Henry and Paul Clifford and Bill Kay. Thank you so much for your wisdom. It was really, really helpful. Um, now, as I said, none of this is to be taken as advice. It's just um, you know we're having a good old chat and we think we've all learned some stuff. Thank you very much for coming. It's been great having you all and uh, come along to the the next one and do come along to to one of my paid uh, webinars we've got in got um, stuff on investing in property we've got someone investing in um <clears throat> bitcoin which is uh, an interesting one at the moment cryptocurrency actually it's always interesting all sorts of stuff so have a look on the um, the webinars page of money magpie thank you for coming thanks guys see you again